So everybody, thanks very much and welcome to another episode of Jedi Aquatics, that's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in aquatics. And as usual, we have some, something special. We're spanning, I don't know how many time zones. We've got 7 a.m. on the one side and 12 midnight on the other side and two time zones in between. So we're coming to you from London, Maldives, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And today we're going to have, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, so to start, let's do some intros. And who would like to start? I, I think maybe I can start since I'm sort of the anomaly in the group in a way. Um, I'm Nadia Huggins. I'm a visual artist from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, I've been practicing photography now, I think maybe about 20 years, actually. I think I'm, I'm getting to that point. Um, but for the last eight to nine years, I've been sort of more focused on doing underwater work, although not exclusively. Uh, but my practice does revolve a little bit around, um, you know, kind of pointing a lens at the environment, looking at people's relationships within these kind of aquatic seascapes and also the landscapes, how how coral reefs sort of impact and affect our livelihood on land as well. Um, and yeah, you know, just kind of showing people like sp specifically Caribbean people's sort of experience within these spaces. Um, and my work has been kind of primarily sort of a mixture between like documentary and conceptual, although I find now my work is sort of existing at the intersections of other things. I've been sort of finding my way stumbling into activism, um, I guess some education in what I do. Um, so I'm not, I don't really necessarily consider myself just an artist because, um, you know, I move around um, different roles, I suppose, as you have to in, in small islands, as you, you guys know. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the gist of, of what I've been doing <laughs> with my practice. And we can get into it a bit more as we go on. Thank you, Nadia. Mm -hmm. Can we shift over to Flossie? Yeah, sure. And... Um... So I'm Flossie, I am based in the UK um, and I'm currently running a project called Ocean Women with a charity called Manta Trust and also with Zuna here um, and doing my PhD at the same time. So my sort of background is uh, marine science, environmental education um, and I've started working in the Maldives back in 2017 um, and I've kind of never stopped. So I lived there for quite a few years and now I'm based back here, but still working there and um, running projects to basically try and get more women and girls to enjoy the sea um, in the Maldives and other tropical coastal communities um, and doing some research on the same topics. But I'm sure we'll go into that a bit more later. Cool, thank you. And last but not least, Zuna. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Zuna. I'm uh, from the Maldives and I am the founder and the CEO of Salt Adventures Swimmers. It's a swim school based in the capital, Male. Uh, we offer swim classes for all ages, starting from two months of, two month babies to adults. And also we offer swim instructor training programs. And um, I've worked in the aviation field for 10 years before uh, doing all this. And now all my work is based on uh, Salt Adventures swimmers and also uh, helping my husband uh, thrive in his field doing free diving. Uh, doing free diving courses as well. And I'm really interested to be here. Thank you. So we've definitely got some diversity going here in terms of backgrounds and disciplines and perspectives. Um, one of the themes that I shared with you all before we had the conversation was the idea of small islands. Um, 
and the uniqueness that comes from being from living on having the experience of a small island um, life so that might be something that comes up but the other thing obviously is you're all women and you're all doing it and international women's day is coming up or we might even cast this on international women's day we'll see how it goes but that other theme of what does that mean um and perspectives differ on that because coming up women being in the water is not anything that i think about at all because we were always surrounded by that whereas in other places it's not like that so how about we open up by maybe you guys and you guys are welcome to um cross and ask each other questions but i'll just start it off by saying or asking what your perspective is on from your experience on being a woman in these fields open to anybody um i mean i i guess i can sort of speak directly to that because i've had projects that have been very centered around men and the water um i have one photographic series in particular called Circle No Future, which focuses on groups of young men. You know, like typical imagery that you see of boys that, that jump off of like jetties or boats or rocks. Um, but focusing on the perspective of what happens when they break through the surface of the water. So sort of showing that vulnerability and fragility of the male body in, in the space. Um, and one of my theories kind of focuses on this idea that, you know, we're able to sort of... Um, abandon all of these social constructs that limit us on land and you know changes our way of being when we're in the water and I think I mean we all must have that experience when we swim it's like a we feel you know like we embody a different um, part of ourselves when we're in that space and I think that's something that I've been really particularly interested in ex exploring particularly with with men um but I mean, as far as women go I mean I I, I can't really speak obviously to the Pacific but I can say, specifically in some the grenadines you know different groups of people have different relationships with the water and i mean it kind of goes across like class and race and and gender and all these different things um more typically you'll see like young men swimming out farther say for example than women so it is a bit of an anomaly um to see women having certain experiences in the water not because they're incapable but because there's been a exclusion of them um not necessarily excluded, but, you know, there's a kind of an understanding that there's a role that a man plays within that space. So you'll see like men going out fishing, for example, or, you know, free diving or spare fishing or whatever. And women tend to stay sort of closer to shore. So that's that's something I've been sort of interested in exploring in recent um, years. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure where it's going, but I always find something about that so fascinating that there's the, very clearly a divide and what we're told women can and can't do when the reality is we're all capable of doing the same things, especially if in the sea. Yeah, I think that's what I fascinated me as well when I first started working in the Maldives. Um, obviously, it, well, the Maldives is a island nation surrounded most islands are very close to the sea most people live close to the sea um and there's quite accessible reefs on a lot of the islands but although women and girls were often in the sea i noticed that they often would just be hanging out in the in the lagoon areas not going out to the reef or the drop off and really like fully immersing um and from my experiences just being like a diver and working in the field i i was like immersing is amazing and when you've got that environment on your doorstep it's a cool opportunity to be able to do that um so yeah that's that's a kind of the premise of the research I'm doing is like why is that why aren't not all women but some women not fully immersing what are the barriers what could enable women to overcome these barriers and what are the impacts of overcoming these barriers on women and girls and their wider communities um, and not just in terms of connecting to that environment, but well-being. And me and Zuna have done lots of interviews with people and found, you know, it has a huge effect on your confidence, your mental health. Um, yeah, just 
feeling free to like explore that environment and and be safe in that environment because there's there can be a lot of fear about that environment so once you learn to swim in deep water then you can overcome that fear and that can impact you in in other aspects of your life um yeah so yeah totally <laughs> Zuna, you want to add, add anything um uh, personally i could uh um, say if uh, we are brought up in uh, close by the sea with families who encourage us to be in that space uh, people tend to find it more connected rather than uh, when uh, they are very disconnected with the ocean when they have their fear uh, they tend to uh not give that opportunity to their kids and they don't have that connection to the ocean yeah uh through through the ocean women uh, interviews even we learn these things uh when mothers are more comfortable in the water they uh, they tend to uh be more encouraging to their families uh to be the same like like it's nothing new mm-hmm. like it's part of their livelihood yeah like yeah. you are for your kids I, i have i have a question about that because i i think we all kind of deal with that issue everywhere i mean specifically with the caribbean people have a sort of a fear of the ocean i don't know if it's some i mean there's a lot of speculation about it being connected to the trauma of slavery and that kind of relationship of um the mid atlantic um slave trade and and how that would have impacted people's lives so most people when they go to the ocean they just stay in the shore and like even along the coastlines people don't build their porches to look out to the sea they build it looking into the road so i mean there like all these little things that have already been kind of built into our life in a way to prevent us from having too close a relationship with that so like how do we encourage people to kind of get over that fear of the ocean and you know swim a little bit farther out so to speak we could always tell them about the benefits the ocean is to offer there's so much research done on all this uh, now if you google a little bit even you could see so many our uh, reports on the benefits and personally if you want to persuade someone close to you it will be it might be useful yeah yeah i've i've been trying that with a couple of friends just testing them out does it work it's, it's, it's been a process but they enjoy it i mean they they definitely like they, like you said like the confidence definitely gets built up when you every time you know you do something a little bit more courageous you know yeah do you um do, do you find that people around you that are fearful of of going into deep water do they express an interest in going snorkeling or diving or seeing the reefs but it's just that they their fear is holding them back yeah i think the i think the vastness of the sea scares them because it really the idea that anything can come at you that's that's always everybody's yeah. fear is that a shark is going to come or like a fish and it's like people sort of understand they don't have a certain amount of control over their body in the water like they do on land so it's like i don't know what i'm going to do in that situation but it's i mean of course the possibility of something is always there right but i feel as if yeah. that's the same on land too i mean but it's you know. different in the sea but I find when you don't have a mask on or you haven't seen underneath you with a mask you have that yeah. fear of the unknown like being in the dark and that yeah I I get it all the time and I know what's down there but I still am yeah. like oh I don't want my mask but I think <laughs> what what we've seen at least I've seen working with school students is like as soon as they even see once what it's like like often and I don't know if the people you're talking about have seen that but um that you build up that fear in your head and you think you know kids have said to me there's there's full of sharks and all of this and in the Maldives there are bigger sharks but they're quite 
like rare you wouldn't usually see them just on the local reef you'd just see like little mm -hmm. black tips or white tips um <laughs> so not especially scary sharks um and yeah a lot of people have you know heard all these stories of um eels biting you and and all these horror stories that um I think for a lot of people are quite quickly dispelled as soon as they experience it themselves, but it is getting them to get to the point where they're going to experience it in a really comfortable and safe way. Um, yeah. I guess. <laughs> but yeah. yeah I, think I agree. I, I think the benefits of doing it outweigh yeah. the reality of whatever they think is out there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like you have to sort of, you know, Put yourself in that situation to see the outcome almost i mean yeah. it, it's, it's very difficult to convince people by just like you said like showing them the benefits like you really have to physically go through the action of doing it show them yeah 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 so, and i think that's what we've seen as well is like some of the programs that have happened in various places in the past have been very much like uh learn to swim in quite a um abrupt um standardized way and they can cause more fear in people because the people who are more scared don't get that personalized like trusting support but zuna's style is very like get comfortable first and then so you feel that safety um i zuna can tell you more about it but that's makes such a difference uh we try to build connection with people first like know know their fear understand from their point of view from their perspective and uh, learn how and what happened to them to have that kind of fear and then when we try to overcome their fear with comfort and uh, slowly with with their level of progression and once we give that space to them uh, when they become comfortable it's an another level of freedom like uh like you men mentioned earlier me how how it is different to people uh, to overcome fear uh like but when you give them the space and time to work on themselves in, in a safer way uh then when they learn like for some people the vastness becomes a scary thing but when once, once you feel and learn in in a way like that the vastness becomes a the uh, like freedom yeah definitely yeah. i th i think also it helps to sort of understand what's really going on like on a reef for example i remember i took a friend out once and he wasn't used to snorkeling and he he had this kind of irrational fear that the sea urchins would suddenly float up and come towards him mm -hmm. but it's just like you know understanding that they they don't do that you know but yeah. i think I mean, without that knowledge it's like you would just automatically assume that everything that's in the in the ocean is just like free range and it's like sees you as like you know fair game which is not true of course like it's yeah. but there needs to be a kind of an educational process as well in what um people will see in a certain space i mean you're gonna encounter some pretty scary looking rocks if you're not used to seeing that but it's like understanding that this serves a purpose and it's not just gonna like you know dislodge itself from the ground and, and float towards you I think part of it is that it's like this irrational kind of idea of yeah. what's underneath the the unknown yeah I, I could add to add something to that uh, I we don't have in the Maldives that the water is very clear there's very little areas they have seagrass which is not very common in the maldives and uh since i was a child i didn't like swimming because i didn't know what was there and i always try to avoid it i'm hesitant to touch my feet even there okay and then this time when we were in uh, the drowning prevention in in that island where we went but rottnest island yeah uh, we swam in that area and at first i was hesitant to go where the where the, it was very dark patches i didn't know what it was and you you mentioned that it is uh, sea grass i didn't know what it was so i was like hesitant to go and see but 
when i went there and after i had this experience it's the most amazing thing i saw like i loved i loved it once i uh, when i had got to see with my own eyes the different types of leaves the different kinds of fish that were there compared to what we have it was amazing so i would encourage anyone to like if they have their own fear like learn read and experience it first hand uh, to overcome the fear even mm-hmm. yeah that was beautiful rottnest island yeah. it was amazing mm mm-hmm. The, I'm enjoying a... just listening to all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Nat. I know I was going to say there's this really cool project in Miami um, called Coral City Camera. I think I think that's what it's called. Yeah, but they basically have an underwater camera. Just they're like doing like a live feed of a reef, <laughs> like twenty four seven, and they're just always posting things. And they have like you know like they'll have like lemon sharks like just come up to the screen and say hi. You know like. So you yeah. actually get to see the life that kind of passes through a space over a period of a day, um, which I think is kind of cool. I mean, like just kind of imagining for these small islands. I think if people were able to kind of like visually engage with what was happening underwater on a day to day basis, it could help dispel some of their fears. I mean, obviously it might trigger some of them, especially if you you don't want to you know like see like an eel, for example, if that already mm-hmm. kind of puts fear into you, but It, it, you know, I think also just seeing things on a day to day basis really makes a difference because most people don't have that experience of going to the beach and looking underwater, as you said, like with a mask. So they're just seeing the dark patches under the sea and not really knowing what's going on there. But you know, like if there's a camera there all the time, or people are sharing photos, and then I think over time you kind of get desensitized, and that can also be a part of helping to dispel some of the fears. Stream with um. Uh, sorry, Zuna, do you want to go? Yeah, no, you can go on. Sorry, I was just gonna say we we used to use a lot of virtual reality as well. Um, with school students, and it was so fun. Like with the adults as well, not just with the students. But um, we had a couple of videos that were made in the Maldives of um this famous bay called Hanifaru Bay, where there's sometimes aggregations of like 200 manta rays and you've got tourists coming from all over the world to see this and then a lot of the people just living on the islands five minutes away have never seen that spectacle um and so we had a couple of videos of those mantas um when they were mass feeding and whale sharks and then mantas cleaning on coral reefs and the reception is amazing um obviously you've got to have the headsets and stuff but once you have the headsets and the films loaded it's i'd say it's like the next best thing to going yourself um and cool. yeah such a good educational tool just like you just said um similar but yeah very immersive yeah, yeah. um i was going to say uh Uh, the whole idea of uh, the ocean women project is uh, you protect what you love and you love what you what you know right so mm-hmm. in order to people to have a connection with the environment with the underwater beauty and for them to have this feeling of uh, you we, we need to protect it first we need to uh, show them first we need to make them understand what we are trying to protect here and once they see it with their own eyes they have this they become this uh, environmental pioneers uh, who are ready to uh, engage their family members and show them what they are trying to uh, protect and everything becomes much better <laughs> Absolutely. I want to jump in for a sec cuz mm-hmm. I'm loving hearing all this. I wanted to jump back really quick to something that you said Zuna about getting people comfortable in the water even before they start to learn. And I I think that's underestimated the importance of that in industry at least from industry as I've experienced it. and 
I always get a little confused because I'm coming from a scuba diving, free diving background as well. So we teach differently in that <laughs> realm because if somebody's not comfortable, they're probably going to end up hurting themselves. So mm. there is a lot of preamble and making sure that somebody's comfortable before you start taking them down even 10 feet. And similar in the swimming. So I'm just the fact that you said that is something I'm going, thank you for saying that because it it gives more momentum to that whole idea that, hey, that when we're dealing with the water, there is an element of that, of understanding each individual and what they need in that sense. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'm kind of wanted to throw something out there because you're talking about especially in the small islands that you have this kind of um, a lot of people aren't familiar with the water, aren't familiar with the ocean, but coming from specifically Simmons and the Grenadine side, we have this chain of islands and there's a fairly significant cultural shift as you go down the islands and you've got the larger Island, which has a lot of people who were come from an agricultural background when they are brought over to the West Indies, all the way down to the smaller islands where subsistence was actually very maritime and very water-based. And you see that difference in how people act. So looking at that, one of the things I picked up from the African aquatic side of things, we always think that we're starting from this baseline of, oh, well, we're not familiar with the water, so we have to become familiar with the water? Or have we forgotten our familiarity with the water? And now we're relearning something that we've lost. Mm -hmm. So one thing I want to throw out is what you all think about the age where we start this relationship. Because coming from indigenous practice, it really does look like from the time you can walk, you're in the water. So do you want to speak to that in your perspectives from all three of you, actually? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you should start somebody from the age that they can walk <laughs> to learn to swim. I mean, I, I always remember my sister taking my niece to the beach and she would just say, you know, just let her go and let her go under. She'll hold her breath naturally. Like, and we trained, we practiced doing that with her from a very young age. You know, I mean, it was kind of terrifying the first time we did it, but it, it was good because it just helped her to get comfortable with the sea over time. You know, I mean... But I, I, I often see a lot of parents bring their kids to the beach and, of course, a child is screaming, getting into the water. Um, but there's a way that the parents seem to deal with the child that seems to make it worse somehow. I mean, there's like a lot of mocking that goes on, you know. Um, it, it, the child is really uncomfortable, so they'll start dunking them at the same time. So I think that also is, like participates in building a necessary fear with some children, not all children, but the majority of kids that I see, um, they understand from that kind of experience that, you know, this is something to be afraid of. I can get into this point, but I can't go beyond it because something terrible could happen to me. So I, I think it's a way that, you know, we kind of deal with children at an age, you have to be sort of encouraging not to, to smother them too much because there does come a point where you just have to sort of let them go and say, okay, look, you need to swim from here to there now and I'm not going to help you, you know, but there needs to be some nurturing first to get to that point, I think. I think that's what is a lot of missing, what we've seen through our research is like that um, mother that can nurture their child in that way because at least on the one I were working with, some of the mothers weren't confident themselves, so they wouldn't let their children go any deeper because they were so scared that if they if something happened, they can't rescue their child. Um, so yeah, that that builds that transfers to your child so quickly. Um, and there was one woman that we interviewed, and she said that she takes her daughter to the sea. Um, her daughter's only about two years old but they go quite regularly and her daughter loves it. Um, and um, her daughter's like, she can see compared to other children her age is much more social and has changed 
in a much broader way since she started doing that as well. So I just thought that was interesting. I was actually just trying to get the interview up to see if I could remember exactly what she said. But yeah, it's, yeah, you need to get them in young and Zuna does classes, baby classes. So the youngest of the young. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's really nice when you could uh, get, get them to love the water at a very young age. Um, there are so many benefits of it. It's like uh, they, the kids who are introduced to water when they are as young as two months of age, they develop their um, uh, so, uh, muscular skeletal system, and they are more uh, like they are more aware to their surroundings. Spatial mm -hmm. awareness is more developed and uh, these kids, they learn to walk faster. Uh, they, they learn much faster than other kids because they were introduced to these environments at a very young age. And um, in Maldives, uh, in the early times when... Uh, uh, the the uh, women we used to do uh, choir rope. Mm. Do you know what choir rope is? Uh, the, mm. It's it's just rope. The women will do this like this, and they will produce rope uh, from coconut uh, husk. I've okay. seen I've seen yeah. I've seen that done. Yeah. Uh, uh, during the early days, uh, they would do to. Um, make the threads, they would uh, soak the husk in the show area. They would uh, dig dig the sand and keep it uh... Yeah, are you following me? Oh, oh I the there. Oh, yeah, you're back. Yeah. You're back. You were just saying Can dig hear? the sand. Yeah, and um, uh, the women will go and then uh, to to get the rope out of it to remove the husk. They would do so much work at the show area and their kids uh, at a very young age, they will be with the parent in the water, around the water, playing and just doing their thing. And, and also uh, the families of fishermen when the uh, fish is caught uh, the mothers the ladies of the household are the one who take care of uh, cooking them and in this process uh, big big utensils are taken to the uh, water area to clean to wash these big large pots after cooking and in these times even my mother she used to say her childhood memory is going with her mother to the show area um uh, to uh, when the uh, when her mother used to go uh, to wash the pots they would take all the kids and they would hang around there uh, play with the with everyone like uh, neighbors will go together all the kids will be in the water we, they live very close to the ocean but uh, sadly due to the socio-economic changes in our community. Uh, this, these are not practiced anymore. Parents are so busy. Um, parents have to work and they don't have time to go. And uh, because they don't practice it, mother, they themselves, they don't know how to swim and they are afraid to, like Flossie mentioned, they are afraid to send their kids. And this, this vicious cycle is going on. And we are aiming to encourage people to not practice this anymore and uh, giving them an option uh, to become close to the ocean again, trying to train more female swim instructors, trying to encourage more mothers to be more involved in teaching the community. Awesome. So I think we've actually come almost to the end of what we had planned. I went fast. And we could probably keep talking a whole lot longer, I have a feeling. 
Um, <laughs> maybe we will one day. But what what I do want to do is I wanted to make sure that we had time for each of you to kind of give some thoughts about about the conversation or anything else that you wanted to say before we go. So if I can go in reverse order, Zuna, do you have anything that you want to sum up or say or anything you'd like to express? I want to thank you for arranging this, for giving us a chance to have this all in one space and getting to say hi to Nadia. <laughs> it's very nice to meet you all too. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Flossie, do you have anything you want to add? Just the same thing, really. I am like fascinated by this in different places. So it's interesting to hear from both of you, Kurt and Nadia, about St. Vincent and the Grenadines and and the Caribbean. And, and it's what you were saying, Kurt, about the, the changes as you go down the island chain. It's similar in, in the Maldives, like every community is so different and there's so many factors that affect that difference in how people connect with the ocean. Um, so yeah, I love learning about new places. So thanks because it's kind of given that opportunity as well oh cool. yeah um i mean similar to everybody of course thank you it's been wonderful to sort of get like a different perspective on what you guys are doing on your side of the world and um i think like the more in most interesting takeaway from this is how do we get people to become less afraid of the ocean and of course, my brain is now ticking. It's like, how can we just get like snorkeling gear into every school <laughs> and, you know, get yeah. kids to go to the water and just see what's happening under there. Even that initial of just moment of just seeing. Um, and I feel like that could be a good um, way to kind of propel people into becoming a little bit braver and braver over time. And it, I mean, it's exciting for kids, right? You see kids at the beach all the time losing their mind when they when they see a bunch of fish swimming past them under the water. So um, I think a lot of kids who have that fear in them that they might not be aware of, you know, I think over time that could really um, be kind of worked out to them in some ways. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just to kind of think of collective ways to make that happen because uh, we do live on small islands and, you know, we are dependent on the sea and, you know, in, in the kind of wake of climate change now and you know, the coastlines kind of changing. I think these are things that we really need to really consider um, for ourselves mm -hmm. moving forward. And it should be a prerequisite to learn to swim, just like it is to, to have your name, you know, in the registry in, in any country, right? So I think those are things that we need to find a way to make sure that it's implemented into our daily lives. Can I just add something to that quickly? Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just from what uh, Zuna and I are doing, we're hoping, we're trialing this, testing if training uh, local people, especially women as swimming and snorkeling instructors, and then supporting them to teach people in their communities um, to swim and snorkel is a, is a good way to start to encourage that change. Um, and it's been, it's been really challenging, but it's been successful so far. We've got five, female instructors on one island that have done three programs already uh, taught about 60 kids and women to swim and they're taking a small fee from each parent and so that provides a bit of an incentive for them to continue um, but what we hope to do with all of the work and research that we're doing is bring it all together into an accessible document maybe a video which right now we're calling an ocean connection strategy that might change but it's going to outline some of those key barriers um, ways to an, overcome barriers, why these things should be prioritized, what the impacts are, and then different models like that swim instructor training model, hopefully in different places, um, that could work. And then the idea is that we share that as widely as we can and people or organizations or community leaders can look at it and say, oh, this might work with our community if we tweak it in these ways and we'll try it. Um, and maybe the research also provides the evidence they need to get the funding to try that program. Um, this is kind mm. of idealistic maybe, but that's what we're hoping for. So we'll definitely share it with 
you guys yeah. once we have it and maybe it can help in your communities as well. Totally, that's awesome. <laughs> Would appreciate that. And it's not idealistic. It's what's needed. Yeah, and I hope if, so. If you, yeah. I, I think we, for me, from the conference where we met, um, looking at some of the initiatives that are going on, I think it's starting to swing in that direction where people are now mm -hmm. finally acknowledging that we need role models. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'd highlight from all of you is this idea of reconnection versus connection is mm -hmm. that we're reconnecting with the water. We're reconnecting with what, especially coming from the Caribbean, coming from the Maldives, that this is who we are. We were of the sea and we're going back to being of the sea. Um, right back to history and how we got to these places in the first place. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much to for making the time and for coming at all of these different times. And if there is interest, this is something that we could do again in the future. But for now, this in and of itself, hopefully will be inspiring and possibly show you all of you as role models for some people coming up who might want to do this kind of stuff. So thanks so much. Thank you guys. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together.